All right, welcome. I'm here with Linda K. Murphy, and we are going to be talking about declarative language, which is such a powerful technique. But before we, we dive into that, Linda, I'd love for you to share a little bit about who you are and what you do and, and how you got into this, this type of work. Yeah, I am a speech language pathologist and have been um, practicing for over 20 years now. And then I became a, a relationship development um, intervention consultant around 2007. So I also practice that a lot as well, which, um, you know, speech language therapy can, you can support individuals anywhere from areas such as articulation, language development, to social communication, social pragmatics, to executive functioning. Um, and then the RDI piece is very much just parent coaching and supporting um, caregivers and families to implement strategies in their natural environments where it's going to make the biggest difference. And I guess, and I, um, I learned about declarative language not when I was training to become a speech therapist, but when I was training to become an RDI consultant. And it just really changed everything I did in terms of my practice. Um, and so I had been talking about it, writing articles, and then in 2020 just published um, Declarative Language Handbook just to get the word out there a bit more. Again, just because I think it's such a powerful strategy that anybody can learn, um, but it's not, it was not as well known, but it's getting more well known now, which is exciting. Absolutely, thank you for sharing. So I just want to share with people who are, who are logging in and listening, if you're not familiar with declarative language, and I'm sure I'm not going to describe this perfectly, but I want to give my kind of novice entry point view, it's reshaping the way you talk to your kids. I mean, I feel like you could even use this with adults or people in general, but it's the idea that instead of uh, being imperative or implying what you need, like go to your bedroom now, it's, oh, it's nine o'clock. Um, hmm, what do we do at nine o'clock? Or, you know, kind of like thinking, you know, sh thinking out loud so that kids have an opportunity to come to their own decisions and ideas about what needs to happen. So strengthening their executive function skills, their planning, their mm -hmm. follow through, their kind of conclusion making. Can you, how do, how do you break down declarative language versus imperative language for a person who has no idea what, what that is? Yeah, and I also, I'll throw in there too, just question asking, because it's also different from asking questions, but like at a bit, at its basic level, declarative language is commenting. So you might be commenting on your observations, your memories, your opinions, um, your idea in the moment, and that's it. Um, an imperative might, is a directive. It tells someone very specifically what to do, and then a question asks the person to come up with an answer. So um, if I were to give like three examples for a similar situation, if you wanted your, um, say your learner to put their coat on before going outside because it was cold out, <laughs> the imperative might be put your coat on. The question might be, what do you think you need right now? And the declarative could range anywhere from something that's guiding but, but clear, such as, I think it'd be a good idea for, to, for you to put your coat on to something where you would give them a, the opportunity to infer a bit more by saying like, oh, it looks cold out. I wonder if you are missing anything or something like that. So declarative just comments, it invites, it guides, but it doesn't place the same type of pressure or demands on the learner as an imperative or questions do. What happens when you place those pressures and demands on learners? Yeah. Your imperative language. So it depends on the learner, but I would say a lot of the kids that I work with, um, it can create, demands can often create a stress response. And what that looks like on our end could be challenging behaviors. So, you know, if you're a caregiver in the home, it could look like a power struggle where, the individual is pushing back and resisting what it is you're asking them to do. Um, but sometimes the challenging behaviors can also be more overt, like yelling, aggression, bolting, but it can be more subtle, such as snarky comments, sarcasm, eye rolls, um, talking back, swearing. You know, I know some of the things, these things can come into play as individuals get into the teen and tween years, you know, parents might see some of that stuff. So I always try and think, 
um, you know, is my language creating a demand that could potentially create a power struggle that could then lead to just challenging behaviors that don't feel good to anyone. Um, and then declarative language is just so nice because it gets rid of all of that and it invites and leaves space for the learner to either be guided or figure some things out on their own, but ultimately to have personal agency. And I think when learners have personal agency, it just has a totally different feel to it. In my work as an executive function coach, I often talk to other coaches on my team and, and other people who want to be coaches about the importance of using like inquiry-based you know, conversations with clients rather than demanding things or telling them because they, they have that response where they you know, pull away if you tell them to do something and then you can't really have that coaching or teacher-student teacher, teacher -student relationship. So what's the, you know, is there a difference between that approach where, you know, where you're inquiring like, hey, what do you think is the next step? Or, you know, how do you think you should start your homework? Or what do you think is the most important thing to start? Do you differentiate between that and declarative language? And can you talk a little bit about the differences between those two things? Yeah, I definitely do. And, um, you know, I also wrote co-regulation handbook. So I end up pulling in a lot of ideas from that. But, but at its heart, I want to set my learner up for success and I want them to be competent. So it's not that I'm not gonna ask questions, it's just that when I ask a question, I wanna be sure that they'll feel competent answering it, and I don't wanna ask a question that's gonna put them in over their head or lead to those stress behaviors because they don't feel competent. So if a learner is just beginning in the process of um, you know, time management, organization, whatever it is you might be engaging with them in, I might guide. Into, you know, so I might say, you know, I'm thinking about all the assignments that you have and the time that you have to do them. Let's look at the calendar together and see if we can figure out how we should map out these things. So that's someone at the very beginning where they really need more scaffolding, but perhaps somebody who's further along and more competent and has some of those foundation skills, you could invite it with an inquiry. You could say something like, um, let's look at the calendar together. I'd love to hear what you think is a good idea. But I think what you really don't want to get into is a, a situation where they give their idea and then you end up correcting it because it's not right or not good. Um, because then what that does is just, it could lead to disengagement and shutting down. So it's just a careful process where you're building them up, scaffolding them so that when you do engage in that inquiry, you know that they're ready for it and they can handle that back and forth dialogue. How much does tone of voice play into the success of using declarative language or, you know, inquiry based questioning? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. So I think um, just using a curious tone is really important. Like I could even tell when you were when you were talking about inquiry based strategies that your tone was very curious. So I think it's really important because ultimately you want to invite the learner to share their ideas without fear of being shut down or being wrong or being corrected. And it's not, again, it's not that um, we can't correct or provide guidance and feedback to our learners. It's just that we really want to be in tune in terms of what they can handle. Like, is that learner able to be vulnerable in this moment? And if I give feedback, can they handle it? Or is any feedback going to shut down that learner and they're going to disengage? And all learners really are at different places along that progression and it's based a lot of the time on the groundwork that you've laid, the relationship that you have with them, your trust in each other. Um, but things that certainly help are not just your commenting, but your, your overall nonverbal communication. Or I always think um, communication is a whole package. It's not just the words that we say, but it's our body position, our facial expression, our tone of voice, our gestures. We want to be warm, inviting, encouraging, curious, empathic. Um, because all those just help our learners engage in the process of learning a bit more and not, not, um, not without fear. Because I think a lot of kids for whom, and, and adults for that matter too, just for whom it's been really hard along the way or they've been misunderstood, they might be hesitant to engage at all. Um, so you just want to, the relationship is really important and those things can kind of build that. So last night I was trying to use... Uh, declarative language of my daughter, who's three, almost four. <laughs> and I was standing, standing there trying to brush her teeth or, you know, I said, I'm waiting here to brush your teeth. 
you know, I'm standing and I was kind of just commenting on what I was experiencing. I was like, you're running around uh, back and <laughs> forth and I'm standing here waiting to brush your teeth. And, <clears throat> you know, I, I've had some moments where it's been very successful. Like, and I feel like she's been surprised where instead of like telling her what to do, I've, mm -hmm. you know, I've been like, oh, um, I wonder if Ali would want to help me with, you know, doing the dishes or with, with making her lunch. And I can see the value in it at the same time. I have felt like, Ooh, this is like almost learning a new language. Like it's, it's like, it's challenging, you know, to continue to shift the way you're speaking instead of telling people to telling someone what to do over and over, you know, repeating it, setting, creating some type of, you know, consequence if they don't follow that direction. What do you say to parents, teachers, coaches who are trying to implement declarative language, but, you know, I feel like there's the beginning where you're like, wow, this is just a completely awesome technique. But then there's like mm -hmm. the middle where it's like, you got to keep applying it. What do you say to people who are in that kind of like middle mm -hmm. part where it's, it's going to take time? Yeah, I would say, well, keep at it because it's worth it. The little moments really and truly build up over time. I think what happens in that middle ground is you get better at um, navigating the breakdown. So it doesn't work out every time, of course not, but then you figure out, okay, I just said, <laughs> I'd love for you to come brush your teeth or I have your toothbrush and the learner or the child is not coming. So then you need to know like, okay, how can I scaffold this without getting directive or imperative? Um, so that can be really helpful. That's where I pull in a lot of the co-regulation techniques, which just means we're working in partnership and thinking about like, how can I adjust what I'm doing to provide that scaffold so that the, the child's still competent or the adult um, and they're more likely to join in this process together. So learning those pieces can be really helpful. Um, I wrote declarative language handbook first and then this kind of question came up a bit and I'm like, oh, well, I just pull in co-regulation but I hadn't written about it. So that's why um, shortly thereafter I, um, yeah, just published co-regulation handbook so that we can use kind of both tools in tandem. Um, yeah, but I think just like stick with it because it really does make a big difference. The little moments build up over time. That's what I hear um, a lot of people say too is um, just the dynamic can change in a relationship. Like if it had been one of power struggles or demanding as you do this more and more a little bit at a time, um, but just the flow and the interaction and the relationship changes from one that maybe had been negative to one that's more positive, inviting, guiding, where, um, you know, we, we get better at guiding, but then the learner also gets better at just receiving our guidance or more open to it, which is important too. Walk me through how you would apply declarative language to a parent who says, I just feel like I'm nagging my kid mm -hmm. to do their homework all the time. Yeah, so what I think about with declarative language is when you get started, I would just first at a place that you can feel successful. You know, so homework will be an important place to use it, but it might not be the best first place to do it if it's not feeling successful. Um, so often I just say, you know, pick one exchange at a time or one opportunity at a time where you feel like you can just be present in the moment. So it could be driving in the car, um, going for a walk, something that you do together with that person where you can just hang out and not ask questions and not place demands and then practice commenting only and then practice giving a bit more processing time for individuals. Um, so I would want people just to feel that flow and feel how it's different so that when you want to plug it into a context that's a bit harder or more feels more demanding, um, you have that practice behind you. But if it were homework, so then with any type of task, like executive functioning task, time management task, homework task, I always want to just think about um, like what's your, what situation do you want to try it out in and be really, um, just be really, uh, maybe just identify one situation because I think sometimes individuals may not engage in homework with you, but it could be a different reason on different days and with different subjects. So, so the more you can just pick one thing to start, the more successful you'll be. So maybe it's math homework that you're thinking about or time management for a writing assignment. Um, and then, and then if typically the 
the student is not has not engaged in the process or responded to declarative language, I would just think about, um, you know, what is it that you want to do first and how can you create a competent role um, to gradually shift from what feels like nagging. And I think I know I'm being more um, like general, generally speaking, because I, I find like what I usually do when I'm with parents or families is I'm, I ask like, can you give me a really, really, really specific example so that together we can break it down and then build it back up using this style of speaking based on where your learner is at um, and, and based on what we think might be hard for them. So. <laughs> I appreciate the nuance. Yeah, I think it's yeah. not a blanket approach and it's very situational. So, so I understand, I understand where you're coming from with that. I wanted to ask about what is the impact of, you know, using declarative language with a student versus not for parents, right? What, what are they going to get out of shifting their language to be more observational, more kind of like showing their thinking rather than imperative, imperative or directive? Mm -hmm. Well, so many things. I think as I talked about, the dynamic of the interaction often will change from one of negative to positive, or the power struggles will decrease because you're giving your um, child more, more agency, which always feels good. But then on a higher level thinking level, um, what you're doing is you're giving them opportunities to problem solve, you know, just to build all these skills, which are important for life, problem solving, predicting, reflecting, self-awareness, self-advocacy, um, observing your environment. There's just so many really important skills that you get to the more that we comment and observe versus direct. Um, I can even give you an example. So, so say, for example, it was one of those days that you needed your child to put their coat on to get out the door. So you could say, put your coat on, and that tells them exactly what to do, and you get out the door. Um, but instead, if you were to say, huh, you know, I'm wondering if you need a coat today, then that instead would give them the opportunity maybe to look at the weather and then make the decision if a coat is needed. So you've got a little bit of decision making in there. Or they make the decision, it is cold out but not as cold as it was last week. Um, I wonder what coat I should wear. So it's again, it's another important, it's another um, opportunity to decision make, but also to integrate pieces of information related to the world, like the weather, you know, whatever the weather is, is gonna feed into what we wear today. Um, so you're laying the groundwork for skills to come in the future, which will support independence. And I know it's just like, it's such a little thing, but just laying the groundwork in that way gives the learner that, those opportunities to think, to problem solve, to reason, to pull in world knowledge, um, to reflect, to plan. And those are the, the exciting skills that we want to get to just by that little shift in your, um, in your language. I find it highly relevant to my work as an executive function coach because the goal of this work is to strengthen executive function skills, right? Decision-making skills um, in children and young adults. And when you observe and allow them to make executive decisions rather than telling them to do something, that's strengthening that executive function skill capability. I really like the example you gave in the book where you talked about a grandparent coming over to the house and instead of saying, go, go greet your grandparent, you just model your thinking. So you say something like, hey, I noticed uh, grandma is pulling up outside. And then that gives the kid the opportunity to say, oh, I should go open the door and greet them. Mm -hmm. And then you get to observe, you know, that genuine interaction rather than just saying like, go hug them, you know, which, you know, doesn't, isn't necessarily a natural or organic experience for the grandparent or the kid. Um, so that's really powerful in terms of the relationships that it can foster. I wanted to ask about teachers, because I think it's really important that teachers understand declarative language. However, I know sometimes they're working in classrooms of, you know, 20 to 30 kids, and it may be hard to, uh, you know, use this type of this language, which calls for a bit more patience and, a, and less kind of res results in the moment, right? It's giving more opportunities to grow and think and independently. What are your thoughts on how teachers can take you know, the declarative language work that you've, you've pioneered and, and implement this into the education system? Yeah, I think, you know, as with all of us, the first step is just self-awareness of our own communication and owning it. 
So, of course, there's times where teachers need to ask questions or maybe need to be um, more directive, but there's probably lots of times that they could be declarative that they're not. So all I ever ask is just people start to think about their speaking style, think about their communication, and just, again, as I said before, just take it one exchange at a time. You know, is this an opportunity that the teacher maybe doesn't feel as rushed, that they could allow for a little more processing time, and they could make that comment instead of the directive? Um, and chances are, you know, even if it's one of the kids that I'm working with, if they might not respond right away to that declarative, their classmates might. And then that also provides additional um, just contextual information that our learner can then visually reference. So they're still having the opportunity to just integrate greater pieces of information. Um, and then the teacher maybe can scaffold from there as needed. But, but I think it's really hard, especially if you're starting out to be declarative all day, every day. And I would never expect that. I just I really do think that the little moments um, build up over time and it's just, you know, seizing on the opportunities when they're upon you and, and just going for it. And, um, and I find that, you know, again, like when people start to use the speaking style and they notice how effective it is, it just reinforces um, like our desire to keep going or just our ability to say, Oh, you know what? It didn't take that much longer than the directive and it felt a whole lot better. So I'm going to keep doing it. Um, but I, I, in some of my trainings recently, I quote um, from Atomic Habits by James Clear, I think it is. And he just talks a lot about how the little moments really and truly build up over time. So it's not about the big event that you do that makes the difference. It's about the little teeny tiny steps that you take along the way and just really trusting that just that little one, you know, maybe you did one declarative statement today instead of zero that you did yesterday. Um, and just know that it matters and it builds over time. Yeah, I like I like that James Clear and Atomic Habits. Mm -hmm. And actually, another way of saying that that I found to be really memorable for me is like those 1% shifts, you know, like 1% shifts compound over time. But then I heard someone else say, um, you know, it was, it was based on financial independence, but I think it can apply to better teaching or better relationships. And it's, it was, they said financial independence is the accumulation of minuscule gains, <laughs> right? But it could also be a positive relationship, right? All the, all the little times that you're investing in your kid by not uh, implying or directing them and just saying, oh, like, you know, I, I could really use some, some help with the dishes right now. Or I could really, uh, you know, mm -hmm. um, wow, it's uh, sunny outside. Mm, I'm thinking I'd like to go for a walk. You know, it, it invites them to, to participate rather than kind of, I guess, you know, demanding of them, um, mm -hmm. which seems to improve relationships over time. I've been experiencing that. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me more about co-regulation co and its relationship to declarative language? Yeah. Um, so the way I always talk about it now is that declarative language is a way of speaking, but co-regulation is a way of being. So what we say matters as long as we're in the right mindset when we enter that communicative exchange. Co-regulation is all about being present in the moment and responding to our communication partner or that learner in the moment with the feedback that they're giving us. So we can have a big agenda and things that we want to get done, but if we enter with that agenda and, and we push too hard too fast, then you know, it leads to those stress behaviors. So the more that we can engage in a way where we're truly present to our learner and declarative language really helps us be present in the moment and not get too far ahead of ourselves, um, then our learners are much more likely to engage and then we move along together. But the way that I talk about it in co-regulation handbook is um, I, I'm always thinking about what's a competent role for my learner at this moment in time. So when I invite them to join me, I want to make sure that I'm inviting them to join me in a role that I know is competent, which just means they can likely do it on their own as long as I give them enough time and maybe a little bit of help. Um, and then the other pieces are of it are that I, I just want their role to be authentic, so not contrived, but just something that's really meaningful in this moment. And that's contingent on my role. So we're partners together. And to make this more practical or real, I'll just give an example, even if we go back to um, wanting the individual to put on their coat before they go outside on a cold day. So you might say something like, wow, I, you know, it's really cold out today. I think it's a great idea if we put on your coat. 
So that could be the declarative statement. And if the individual um, is tuning in and far enough along and ready to go, you know, maybe they'll get their code on their own and you're out the door. But for a different individual, they might get stuck and they might not go to get that code. So then you're, you've put that declarative comment out there, they haven't moved forward, and then you think, okay, what can I do? And in that moment, I just think, okay, for whatever reason, they're not solving this problem, they're not getting their code, that's not a competent role. So I'm going to partner with them. I, maybe I'll get the code, and then their new role is, um, like maybe I'm the holder upper and they're the putter honor. So I would say something like, oh, let's get your code. I'll hold it and you can put it on. So I'm still using that declarative statement, but I'm tweaking a little bit to make their role competent in that moment. And it's for the sake of positive forward momentum. Like we, you know, sometimes we just have to get out the door and sometimes I can give like lots of processing time, but if it's one of those days that I can't, that co-regulation and that partnership and keeping them competent, um, is, can be really, really helpful. And over time, it just builds the skills also that you're wanting. I really like how in that example, because I think in my mind, sometimes I'm like, okay, if, if, I, didn't, if I use co, you know, declarative language, I observed that it was cold out, wanting them to you know, put their code on and they didn't. And so I had to do it. I'm like, I failed. I didn't do it right. You know, I, mm -hmm. I, I missed some step in this, but I like how you model or you know, demonstrated that you can keep breaking down these skills, right? You know, of, okay, even though you didn't necessarily pick up on the cue that you should be grabbing your coat, I can bring your coat over and I, I could say something like, I have your coat out. And then my daughter might say, okay, I'm going to put my arms in it. Um, mm -hmm. So it's like continuing to, you know, zone in on what I talk a lot about in my business is the zone of proximal development. Like what's the space mm -hmm. that they just need a little bit of help from a, you know, a competent instructor to reach. Um, I'm curious, hearing you talk about it, I'm also very passionate about, you know, sharing the work of John Hattie, John Hattie, who did this massive research study on what are the biggest impactors on student achievement. And at the top of that list was teacher estimates of achievement. And as I researched that, I found out that it's basically the teacher understanding what the most, cap you know, what the thing is that the child is capable of doing within their, their zone of competency. Um, so I wanted to, you know, I wanted to connect those two things for the audience yeah. because it sounds like you've tapped into exactly what it is. Like co-regulation is basically assessing in the moment what it is they're capable of and, and being there for them to kind of nudge them or support them in kind of taking that next step without necessarily, you know, demanding or directing them to do it. Yeah, that's exactly, exactly it. And um, I think the way I talk about it in my book is just another similar term, edge of competence. So we're always mm -hmm. thinking about that edge, and the edge can move. Um, yeah, and chances are, if you get it just right, if you offer or invite a role at that edge, the learner nine times out of 10 joins because they also know that they can do it. I think when they don't join is when we're five steps beyond their edge and they're no they're not competent or they don't perceive themselves to be competent so yeah it's just like that very fluid process where we're present in the moment um you know we we know where our learner is we know a good next role to offer them and and it's not like it might sound like it's complicated but i think when you're in sync and in tune with your learner it becomes easy because you know them you just have to trust yourself and trust what you know about that person that you're with I love the framing of it as the edge of competence. And for people out there listening, I think especially one of the reasons a lot of parents come, come to me in my organization is because they don't know their kid's edge of competence. And it's not that, you know, it's um, necessarily like intentional. They're just like, I, I keep asking them to like use their calendar and they don't do it. And in my mind, I'm thinking, well, there's actually like a lot of skills that lead into mm -hmm. using a calendar, you know, not just the technical, like, how do I plot things in and, you know, but also making time estimates also, mm -hmm. you know, drawing the information from the portals and making sure you put those in and then, you know, checking off if you completed them or if you reschedule them. So there's so many different, you know, aspects, but as adults with kids, we often um, forget what it's like to be that kind of new learner of these skills. How do you help you know, because I know part of your work is relationships and, and you know, mm -hmm. and how do you help parents understand what the edge of competence is for their kid in a way that's helpful? Yeah. So I always will go back to 
what specific thing are we talking about? Because it's going to vary, you know, calendar skills, math problems, even skills within the calendar skills, like it's all going to be different. So we just have to know what we're talking about, what skill we want to build. But then what I, how I define competence in co-regulation handbook is again, like I can do it on my own as long as I have enough time. So if we're asking someone to do something and they're just not doing it, chances are it's not competent or it's not competent at that moment in time for whatever reason. Um, not to get too far like off track from competence, but I know sometimes uh, you know, a student maybe did something yesterday. So, so the adult is like, oh, I know they can do this. They did this yesterday, but then they're not doing it today. And so in those moments, you know, I'm thinking like, okay, well, what's getting in, in the way at this moment in time? And it, it could be things such as hunger, fatigue, um, maybe, you know, and this happens to us as adults too. It's not specific to kids. You know, did I have a bad day? Um, and of course, like we all have to deal with bad days and we all have to figure that out. But when we as adults have a bad day, people help us. They partner with us a bit more. And there's no reason why we can't do that for our kids if they're having an off day or they're extra tired, they had a bad night's sleep. You know, they're not as in tune with their hunger cues. So hunger is getting in the way. Um, so, so again, like to go back to competence, can they do it at this moment in time? If they're resisting or saying no, then the answer is, okay, no, they can't do it at this moment in time. Let me figure out how we can break this down a little bit more to find the place of, of um, joining. Like I'm always just looking like, what's that, that place where you will join this engagement with me and then together we'll build it back up. And we'll always build it back up, but we won't build it back up if we don't first um, figure out that place where, where they will join and, and feel safe joining. Um, so I don't know if I answered your question or if I went off on more tangents, but. No, yeah. you know, I, I, I have follow-up <laughs> thoughts. Before I, before I um, ask you some follow-up questions on that or, or, and also share some ideas, I wanted to let everybody know who's listening right now. If you have questions, we're getting towards the end and drop those into the chat box. If you have questions, um, I'll bring those, I'll bring those to the front so Linda can answer those. Um, so just wanted to let everybody know that, but on that, on that topic, um, you know, one thing that, that comes to mind and it's like, I've, I've been using declarative language and trying it out and, and it's almost like a complete shift in the way that you communicate. And then what happened, what I've noticed is it actually shifts my thinking. So because I'm always thinking in demands and, you know, concessions or whatever, or some, I demand it and it must happen. But if I shift it to, I'm observing, I'm like observing my experience, I'm sharing my thinking and inviting the person to participate, but not necessarily expecting it, even though there still is some expectation kind of hidden probably behind there. Um, it totally shifts thinking. And it's like, it's almost like, it's hard to even put into words, but it's like when you go from thinking totally in one way to a, to flipping it, it's pretty amazing. Um, it's challenging. It's still challenging. It's not easy, but um, that's why I wanted to share that because I think um, I haven't really come a lot of, upon a lot of strategies like this where I'm like, wow, this completely like flips the way that I I think. Um, and so I wanted to ask you, you know, I, I know you you've got the book, you've got the, the the two books. I also saw that you you've written co-written a book with Michelle Garcia Winner. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about like what's the best way to access this type of work to kind of start to involve yourself in it and, and, and have a better understanding of how to use co-regulation, declarative language. Um, yeah. In social um, strategies. Well, I think I, I'm most active on my website right now, which is declarativelanguage.com. I have a blog. I put a post out every Sunday. Um, I also have other resources on there, handouts. Um, there's some recordings that people can access or pod, podcasts. You can, of course, buy the books. You know, I'm told that they're, well, my goal was for them to be very practical, user-friendly, like what to do on the ground, because that's who I am. Um, and I do hear that that is what people like about them. They're a quick read and you know what to do right away. So I would say those are all the best places to get your feet wet, to start to play around with the ideas. Um, and on my handout page, a lot of them I develop just as follow-ups to questions that I get. Um, or well on the on the website there's two FAQ 
sections, just questions that I tend to get a lot about declarative language and co-regulation. And then for many, there's also handouts. So for example, you know, what do I do when my child's upset? What do I do if declarative language doesn't work? Like, how do I troubleshoot it? What about non-preferred tasks? Um, how do you use declarative language to support managing screen time? So all of those, a lot of those um, popular topics are there that you could read, read about, get a handout, um, maybe listen to a recording on a podcast or something like that. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, I found your website to be really helpful. And then also, I looked under your your podcasts and webinars, and there's very specific ones to like ADHD, you know, talking with, um, you know, different professionals or, you know, uh, so I think that'll be helpful for parents. We've got we've got a couple of questions coming in here. So I'm going to bring it up onto the screen. Um, Lucy asked, I feel torn between mm -hmm. learned helplessness slash attention seeking behaviors and achieving that edge of competence. Fastest mm -hmm. way to find that sweet spot. <laughs> well, I know I'm repeating myself now, but I would pick one context that you want to build competence in, I think, and, and pick one and only one to start because then you'll, you'll feel it and your child or your learner will too, where you can get that flow. I just think it can be really hard to try and hit everything all at once. Um, but if you pick one place that you want to break down and build competence or figure out that edge, that might then help you internalize the strategies for your particular child or student. Um, and I do think, again, like the learned help helplessness or if an individual is attention seeking um, or connection seeking, I sometimes like to reframe it in that way too. Um, like some of those might be because they're not feeling competent. So the more we can lay the groundwork and support them to feel competent, those things often decrease because they're feeling good on the inside. They're internalizing, um, you know, the, the competence or the, or the good, the, the qualities that will improve um, self-esteem. Yeah, I think that's the hardest thing for, for parents um, is that oftentimes a kid, a neurodiverse kid will have a range of challenges um, related to succeeding in a neurotypical school environment. And so how do you focus on those little you know, skill areas. I talk about a lot in my business about celebrating micro wins. It's like, mm -hmm. what is the smallest thing we can celebrate? Um, because it is easy to get in that deficit mindset that, you know, they're not, they're not hitting these benchmarks of success or they're not achieving at grade level in whatever area or across multiple areas, but really focusing on those small micro wins, I think can be very helpful. Yeah. Yep. Christina asks, can you give some examples of how to use declarative language when dealing with a resistant teen, specifically spending a lot of time gaming and avoiding in-person socializing because it's anxiety provoking? Yeah. Okay. Let me think. <laughs> so you're not ever going to get at this, I think, while they're gaming. Um, I think a lot about planning ahead and reflection and processing time. You know, it's really going to depend on who that learner is. But what I might do is just outside of the moment, make observations. Like I notice you game a lot because I think you feel really competent while you're playing. I'm also thinking about times that we could get you with other kids where you feel comfortable and not anxious. Maybe we could brainstorm together some of those types of opportunities. So even engaging the learner in that problem solving or that process. Um, and even knowing it's going to be, I always think of this too, it's a narrative that's going to unfold over time. If we, if we go too quick to try and, um, you know, find that one thing that's going to fix it, then we're rushing ahead to fix without including our learner in the problem solving process. You know, so, so I would think about, or maybe like, this is what you might know about this learner is what are, what are social contexts that you have observed them to be competent in? And maybe those are places that you start um, reflecting like, oh, you know, I noticed when we did X, Y, and Z, and it wasn't a video game, you actually did okay. I'm thinking maybe we can find more opportunities like that. Let's think about what are the elements of that particular situation that felt comfortable and successful to you, you know, and then, and just elements that I start to think about are like, what's the environment that's less, that's most comfortable and competent. What's the number of people that's most comfortable, comfortable and competent? Um, because the bigger the group, the harder it is. 
Um, is it, you know, familiar peers versus less familiar? Like maybe they'll feel most comfortable to start with cousins, for example, rather than um, classmates. So I think the first step maybe would just be to engage that learner in problem solving around what are the elements of a social context IRL in real life <laughs> where they feel comfortable and competent and then together figure out opportunities from there. Um, yeah, process. I always think to a lot like it's process over product, but you know, and it takes a little bit longer, but at the end of the day, as you engage in those conversations and, and look, look to build those competencies and opportunities with your learner, then they're increasing in their self-awareness, um, which will support their ability to self-advocate and just, um, you know, do what they need to do in natural environments to stay regulated and successful and competent. Everything I'm hearing reminds me of the fact, and I love that you said process over product, it reminds me of the fact that this type of work is relational and not transactional. And I think, unfortunately, because of the way our society is set up or something, people are used to the idea of I pay for something and I get something in a predetermined amount of time. What do you, what do you say to parents or, you know, to people who, who are like, I'm paying for this after six sessions is the problem solved? Or, you know, what, mm -hmm. what are your thoughts when you kind of hear that type of approach to this work? Yeah, well... You know, I think, um, I, well, one, one message that I guess I try and talk about a lot is that it's the long game. And, um, you know, if we want to do anything that has lasting effects, we have to, it's not a quick fix. And it's a slow build and um, engaging learners in the process of their own um, increasing independence, competence, self-awareness, self-advocacy. It just, it takes time. It takes time for us. We have to build the relationship. That's really important because trust has to be there. Um, and then, yeah. And then the relationship just supports everything. So I don't have a quick answer to that question, except it's the long game. And, and, um, and it, I guess it just helps to know, like, what is it that we want? What are our goals for our kids or our, or the students? Is it that, they can check off a box or is it that they're an empowered, competent individual who knows who they are as a learner, as a communicator and can advocate for what they need in the world? Like we're all still working on, on those things. They're lifelong goals, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but I think having the same lens and the same vision and, and appreciation that it's the long game um, can help. And, and then you even more so appreciate those micro wins that you were talking about. Yeah, I really like framing it that way. Yeah, is it a kid that we want who can check off a box and complete a homework assignment or do we want them to be able to advocate for their needs and, you know, use their accommodations or, you know, make a situation that works for them because that's ultimately what leads to meaning in the big picture. I heard I heard um it was actually Barack Obama talking about politics, but not to bring that in here, but he I like the way he described change and I wanted to share it because I think it's the same with, with these type of relationships. He said, you know, trying to make a change um, is like, you know, playing football where you're just bumping up against each other over and over. And it feels like you're maybe only making one foot or two foot of, of gains. And then all of a sudden, you know, a hole opens up and you run to the end zone and not that, you know, a relationship with a kid is like some end zone goal, but it's probably going to be a lot of like slow, you know, micro gains. And then eventually, because I, 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 re I really enjoyed the story you shared in the book about, I think it was a boy who um, was autistic and he was very silent when he would show up to your meetings with his mom. And then mm -hmm. after a few years, he was very expressive. Can you, can you tell that story again, just for yeah. the audience? And this is, um, it's so funny because I was just thinking about him and his mom this morning. I sent them an email because I haven't seen them in a little while. Um, but he's an adult. So he and his mom came to me when he was, uh, I think, 21. And, um, and I think he had been just in a very imperative setting for a long time where people assumed he couldn't access declarative language. And so when our, when our work started, it was like not at all. Well, actually, the reason his mom came to me is cause, because she just wanted their communication to be deeper and richer. And she knew he had a lot going on in his mind and that he was thinking about, um, but he couldn't communicate that. His language skills weren't, weren't such that he could communicate. And so our first goal was not to get him to sh talk more, share his memories, anything like that. It was just to help her become um, just 
more versed in declarative language and co-regulation and be able to use these. And so over the course of time, his language has just really, really grown. And, um, and then when we would see each other, he would always come and just be wanting to talk about something that he was thinking about. Um, often it involved a memory from when he was younger. And I just think he didn't have the language skills you know, beforehand to communicate memories, but the declarative language over time built up that those language skills for him, that all those memories that were there in his mind, he could now express because he had the language. So he would share, um, like, I think the story I tell in my book is he saw a train advertisement at the train station where we would meet. And it was different from the train advertisement that was there when he was a young boy, <laughs> like 20, you know, however, 15 years ago. And so one day he came and he was just asking questions like, well, why in his communicative style, why, why is the advertisement different today than it was 15 years ago? And it was just him wanting to, he was curious about the world and he was seeking out information about, about the world and how these things go together, which then provided his mom and I opportunity to share about perspective taking or big picture ideas like, well, that would be very expensive to have the same advertisement or people would get bored. Um, but a lot of his memories would come out over the course of time. And, and I know it was because his mom changed the way that she communicated with him. So there was those language patterns. He was learning them later in life um, and had the space to share. Yeah, it's really, it was an amazing story because I think we all know a kid like that who's very quiet, who doesn't speak much, who kind of depends mm -hmm. on, you know, being told what to do or directed rather than kind of like picking up on cues and starting to share their thoughts or question things. So mm -hmm. it's a very powerful story. And that probably goes back to the question we're just talking about. It's like, when a parent comes in and they want a solution, you know, in successions or whatever, what is the actual result or working towards? And that's a great example of it is a kid whose language abilities bloom because he's given more opportunities to, you know, share his thinking, share his thoughts, uh, hear how competent thinkers and communicators share their observations. Mm -hmm. It can all play into the end result. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm like, oh, maybe a good goal even for six sessions is just to establish a trusting relationship where the student is open to guidance, because that's a really big one for a lot of our learners. They're just not open. They're shut down. They push back. Um, and, you know, six sessions, you might get there, <laughs> depending on the, on the student, you know. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I always just think, like, once you have that feedback loop, that trusting relationship, then... Um, then the sky's the limit because if kids are open to your guidance, there's nothing you can't teach. So. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that is a great place to, to end. Um, and I, you know, there's a question in, in the chat box. What is the name of your book? So, you, you know, do you want to share the names of your three sure. books? And I'm also going to drop in a link. I'm going to be sending out this, this video with links to all your books or the three books that I have. Um, so you, you can share and, and I'll drop this. Great. in the chat box. Thank you. Yeah. It's declarative language handbook and co-regulation handbook are there two that I'm thinking about most um, these days. And they're both on Amazon and links for the books are on declarativelanguage.com. Yep. And I've also dropped into the chat box, a link to my newsletter. Um, oh, great. At the end of this week, what I'll do is I'm going to send out this, this conversation as well as links to all of Linda's books so that um, people can easily access them, access them there and check them out if they'd like. So Linda, I just want to thank you so much yeah. for, for what you're putting out into the world um, because it is impacting my parenting. Um, mm -hmm. I appreciate that. And then also um, it's impacting, you know, what I'm sharing with the coaches that I work with and um, it's impacting a lot of kids. I, I just can mm -hmm. see, see that just from my little small experience, but I, I'm very grateful for, for what you've pioneered here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thanks for having me. It's always great to just bring it, bring it, bring the conversation to places to keep it real. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I'd love, yeah. I'd love to invite you back in the future. Let me actually, before we end, let me ask you, is there something we should be looking out for in the coming years? Are you working on any big projects that we uh, should uh, tune yeah. into? I, um, I haven't started yet, but in my head, I want to, well, I mean, the ideas are in my head. I haven't put it to paper yet, but I want to do the, like um, a hand declarative language co-regulation handbook for, for teens, tweens, and young adults. So just so that I can really clearly show how these um, concepts apply 
no matter your age, like especially as, as um, individuals get older. So that's mm. on my radar right now. Yeah. Well, that's so interesting you say that because one of the questions I forgot to ask, excuse me, or that I was going to bring up was your section on being able to kind of tolerate differences and, and appreciate them. I was like, you know, you talked about how to hear someone who has a different opinion than you and to observe like, wow, you feel really strongly about that. That's not how I feel, you know, but I thought this is what's missing from our world yeah. right now. Like this You're is kidding. so mm -hmm. in demand, this idea of being able to appreciate someone else's viewpoint, but not agree with them or feel like you have to like comply or go silent. Like I was like, man, I'm learning from this. I, I struggle <laughs> with that myself. So that'd be great to, to learn more yeah. about that. Yeah. It's hard work for all of us. That's what we're all <laughs> doing right now. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm going to end the broadcast, but thank you everybody thank for joining you. today and uh, we hope to see you again soon.